Heavenly Father, we have come here this morning assured of your love for us through the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we have come here looking for that thing which only you can give, peace. Peace in the forgiveness of our sins through your dying and rising again. Peace in the knowledge of eternal life that is ours in your resurrection. Peace because of the Holy Spirit whom you have sent to us to work in our hearts through your word, to create and to strengthen faith, to settle that peace upon us. May your peace be with us this morning in everything that we think and say and do and throughout the week as we go about to serve you in peace. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We'll begin with hymn 202. Welcome, happy morning, 
age to age shall say, Hell today is vanquished, Heaven is won today. Please arise. Uh, the order of service this morning is taken from the red hymnal on page 5 and is printed in your bulletin. We begin this service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And now for Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who hast given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those that believe on his name, he gives power to become the sons of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. He be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us, Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. 
Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts. And you might notice during the Easter season, the weeks of Easter, the pericope uh, lectionary shifts from Old Testament epistle, gospel, and psalm to Acts epistle, gospel, and psalm. And uh, one of the reasons they do that is because you don't get a lot of the book of Acts otherwise because it's not Old Testament, and it's not epistle, and it's not gospel. It's kind of its own thing. And also because the book of Acts is completely built on the resurrection of Christ. And you go through the book of Acts, and it talks about Jesus being preached throughout the world, and the church growing, and again and again and again, what they're preaching is that Jesus, whom they crucified, is risen from the dead, and people believe in that message. So we have the same thing here in this reading from Acts 4, verses 32 through 35. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Our psalm is Psalm 148, and I forgot to do the bolded thing, so we'll read it responsively. I'll read verse 1, you read verse 2, and so on. Just take a verse at a time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you brightest heavens, and you waters above them. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and they shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. Mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Our second, second scripture reading this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It is the account of Jesus showing himself to the disciples uh, on the first week, on the, the same day of his resurrection, and then again uh, eight days later, and Thomas was there with them. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold the forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, 
His disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So far God's word. Please arise. And we join in the confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, and we'll sing the hymn that is printed in your bulletin. For our encouragement, this the second Sunday of Easter is taken from John's first epistle, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. 
This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So far the words of our Lord. We pray, Lord, make us confess our own sin in your faithfulness and righteousness. Amen. There is a uh, TV show that I've watched a few times. It's called Mythbusters. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. These kind of scientists who take up Things that seem unbelievable, whether it's something you saw in a movie or, or some you know, myth about what will happen if you combine this with that, and, and they, they test it. Go into the laboratory, and they try to figure out, is this a myth, or are we going to bust it? Can it not happen? Is it fact, or is it fiction? And they do this by um, watching, observing, looking, hearing, touching, testing, and reporting. Sound familiar? Sounds a lot like what John says in the first few verses of our text, doesn't it? The scientific method is kind of what it sounds like he's talking about. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. And notice, um, it might seem like it's redundant here. Seen with our eyes and looked upon, but it's not being redundant. The word here, looked upon, has the idea of investigating something. Paying careful attention to it. Scrutinizing it. And I have touched with our hands. And of course, they're talking about Jesus when they say the word of life, that which was from the beginning, the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. There's talking about all that he did and said, all that he came to do, which, was, which found its culmination in his death and his glorious resurrection. Interestingly enough, the, the word here in uh, verse 1, touched with our hands, the word there for touched is only used in one other place in all scripture. And it's used of Thomas saying, unless I touch his hands at his side, I'll never believe. And of course, Thomas did. He saw, he heard, he touched, he believed that Jesus was truly risen from the dead, that this was fact and not fiction. Most people today assume that Christ's resurrection is fiction, that it's a myth. And the reason they do this is because they can't see it. And they've never seen anyone rise from the dead. Most people just assume that if you've never seen something happen before, it can't ever happen. And then they assume that that's science. But it's not. And if the Mythbusters tried to take this up, you know, could Jesus really have risen from the dead? I'm sure they would say that it was fiction. But that's because they cannot observe or test this. They weren't there. And if they tried to take a human being and raise him from the dead, it wouldn't work. They wouldn't even get Frankenstein's monster. But... That doesn't prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead because Jesus was unique. No human being by himself has the power to rise from the dead. But Jesus was true God and true man. As John points out in these opening verses, he says that which was from the beginning, who was with the Father from eternity, but then came with us so that we could hear him and see him and, and touch him. True God and true man, unique. Jesus himself said, no one takes my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. No one else could say that. God the Father can't say that, because God the Father doesn't die. Jesus alone, true God and true man, has both the ability to lay down his life and to take it up again. And that uniqueness is what Thomas finally recognized about Jesus when he said, my Lord and my God, that he was truly risen, that the resurrection of Christ was fact and not fiction, and the wonderful thing that John shows us in this text is that the fact of Christ's resurrection, as unbelievable as it is, brings a number of other unbelievable and wonderful facts to us. The first of these is that we ourselves become witnesses of his resurrection. You know, an eyewitness is an important thing in a court case. 
juries give an eyewitness uh, a lot of credence. They pay a lot of attention to what they say. And I was kind of curious about, about exactly how reliable they are. I was talking to a lawyer that I sort of know. I think he's like a third or a fourth or a fifth cousin or something like that. And I only know him on Facebook, but he's the only lawyer I know. So I was talking to him about this. And he said that juries pay a lot of attention to what eyewitnesses say, but eyewitnesses are not very reliable. And it's not that they're lying, but there have been all kinds of studies done to show that they fill in the blanks. You ever had that happen where you're talking with your siblings about something that happened when you were growing up and the three of you or four of you or whatever are all sure that you remember it rightly and you all disagree? It's not that one of you is lying. It's that our memory has blanks and we automatically kind of fill it in. Or there's something we don't understand and we interpret it one way or we forget what really happened and we fill it in with something else. Eyewitness, human eyewitnesses are, are very unreliable witnesses. And a good example of that is Ferguson, Missouri. You know, what happened there? The cop shot that man. And there's a billion witnesses, and about every single one of them tells a different story. And their stories are extremely opposed to each other. So can you really pay attention to any of them? That's what eyewitnesses are normally like. Well, what about the resurrection of Christ? All we have is eyewitnesses. But these are not unreliable for a number of reasons. And, and the first is that there's so many of them. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, says that there were the apostles, and there was James, the brother of Christ, and then there were more than 500 people that saw him. And all of them tell the same story, that it was Jesus who was dead, that was risen bodily. And Thomas, you know, doubted, and he even touched. And they all report this to us. Furthermore, the witness of the apostles is particularly trustworthy for two reasons. The first is that it's inspired. You know, John here keeps saying this. We report this to you. We write these things to you. We tell these things to you. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched. We're telling you these things. Uh, Jesus promised the apostles that he would send them the Holy Spirit to bring to their remembrance all the things that they had seen. What that means for us is that when we're reading the words of the apostles in the New Testament, and their accounts of Christ's resurrection, we don't have to wonder if maybe they forgot what really happened and filled in some blanks. The Holy Spirit inspired these men to write these words and called to their mind the exact events that happened. There's no doubt about that. Uh, other people say about the apostles, well, you know, maybe they just made the whole thing up. They just did this in order to create a religion. They wanted to keep this thing going that they had. But there's a big problem with that claim. Let's think here about what reason a person would have for starting a religion that they knew was false. We have a case example. His name's L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard in the uh, 20th century often said, and, and there are many witnesses to this, that he thought a really good way to make a million bucks would be to start a religion. And then he did that. He's the founder of the Church of Scientology. It might seem stunning that people would go along with a religion from a man who said openly and publicly that he was going to start a religion to make a bunch of money, but they did, and he did make a bunch of money. He at one point bought a fleet of yachts and sailed around the ocean for 12 years. His son tells everybody the guy's a fraud. Of course he's a fraud, but why would he admit that? He's living large. So what about the apostles? Did they have any earthly reason for starting this religion? They were not rich, they were all poor. They were all persecuted, and all of them except for John were martyred. And you know, the Bible tells us about one of those deaths, but church tradition and historical accounts tell us about the rest. So let me ask you, if you started a religion in order to get some money or to get some fame, to have an easy life on this earth, if you lied about Christ's resurrection knowing that it meant you weren't going to actually rise from the dead like you were claiming, would you really keep it up if you didn't get any of those things? And then if somebody was holding a gun to your head and said, all right, admit that you lied or I'm going to kill you. There's no way that anyone would do that. The apostles were not lying. They weren't making this up. They had seen it. They had seen Christ. They knew that he was risen. This is what they themselves had investigated, even though they hadn't believed it was going to happen, even though Jesus had told them. And they knew that someone could take their life, but it didn't matter. Because Christ, through his resurrection, had given them eternal life. They believed what he said. Because I live, you will live also. And through their witness to us, that reliable witness, the Holy Spirit inspiring these apostles, we're witnesses too. 
Obviously, we weren't there like Thomas. But Jesus says that we're actually more blessed. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We are witnesses just as strong as the apostles were because we have faith. Some people say that seeing is believing. You know, they say, I won't see it until I believe it. Thomas kind of subscribed to this, and I suppose the Mythbusters would subscribe to this. With many things, that's a fine idea. But when it comes to Christ, it's not how it works. Seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. When the Holy Spirit works faith in our heart through the message that Jesus Christ, as promised, died and rose again, then we see. Then we know that his resurrection is fact and not fiction. And we can tell other people that because his word has this wonderful power to give that certainty, which nothing else can give. It's just what John said in our gospel reading. He said, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's what we have as witnesses. The sure certainty that Christ's resurrection is fact and not fiction. And we can be witnesses of that to other people as well, of this wonderful, unbelievable, blessed thing that we are witnesses of his resurrection. There's a second wonderful and seemingly unbelievable fact in our text, and it's found in verses 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Sorry, just in verse 3. That we have fellowship with God. That is the second fact that Christ's resurrection brings to us. And it's kind of unbelievable. Uh, in high school, my favorite class, one of my favorite classes, I don't think I had one, but one of them was geometry. And not just to like draw some circles or anything like that. Geometry is really logic. It's about proofs and theorems. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. A proof is a logical uh, thing with premises and conclusion. So, for instance, premise A could be, if it were raining outside, the sidewalk would be wet. That's a true premise. A sidewalk is outside. If it's raining, it's going to be wet. Okay, that's premise A. Premise B could be, it's currently raining outside, and therefore the conclusion is the sidewalk is wet. This is obvious. This is logical. That's what a proof is. But we have a proof in our text. And we find the first premise in verse 5. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That's premise A. God is perfect. He's holy. He doesn't have sin, and he doesn't hang around with sin. He doesn't have fellowship with sin. All of Scripture testifies to this truth. And even our own natural knowledge of God testifies to this truth. Everybody assumes that God must be good. And when people think that God isn't good, they then say that there is no God. We know that God is light. That's the first premise. The second premise is found in verse 8 and also in verse 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The second premise is that we're sinners. We're darkness. Not just a little bit, but a lot, entirely sinful. So the conclusion from these two premises would seem to be that we do not have fellowship with God. And we cannot live with God, and we cannot be with God. He's light, there's no darkness in him at all, we're darkness. Except there's a third premise. I didn't say it before because I wanted to make it more dramatic. The third premise is in verse 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Faithful and just. The word faithful means that he keeps his promises. So as Jeremiah said, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Or as the writer of the Hebrews says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. If he said it, he's going to do it. What a comforting truth about God. The second, justice, is also comforting, but it might not seem like it. Faithful and just. Just means that he's fair. He's a just judge. He's going to punish the bad and he's going to reward the good. And since we are so bad... It seems like it should be frightening, but it's also good because God, who is light, who is faithful, who is just, is also gracious, and he found a way to justly punish our sin without punishing us, and we see that in chapter 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation is a big word with a wonderful meaning. It means a sacrifice that satisfies. So, for instance, if your stomach's growling, it's demanding food, and you go down to the restaurant and you stick a burger in it, 
you have satisfied your hunger pains, you have propitiated your stomach. In a much more wonderful, much bigger way, Jesus Christ is the propitiation. God's justice demanded payment for the sins of the world. All of the great iniquities and transgressions cried out for punishment. But God, instead of punishing you and me for them, punished Christ for them. On Calvary's cross, where he suffered and died and bled, torturous ag agony for the sins of the world. He was bearing the load. He was propitiating us. And it satisfied God's wrath so that God's justice was fulfilled and God's faithfulness was fulfilled for just as God had promised, so he had sent the Messiah. Just as God promises you and me, so our sins are forgiven. And therefore, the conclusion is different. Because premise C fulfills, changes premises A and B. So that we are no longer darkness, we're no longer sinners, but we are light in the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's what John means when he says that we need to walk in the light as he is in the light. He's talking about faith. He doesn't mean that we don't have any sin. We'll talk about that more later. What he means is that we confess our sins and we trust in Christ for forgiveness because he gives us that forgiveness through his propitiation. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin so that we have fellowship with God. This close, intimate connection that we have eternal life with him, both now by faith and eternally by sight, when we'll live with him forever. That's what Jesus said himself about eternal life. He was praying to the Father and he said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Having faith in Jesus and his resurrection gives us that eternal life, that fellowship with God, because it is Christ's resurrection which makes this theorem work, which brings us this fact. His resurrection proves his faithfulness because he rose just as he said, the angel told us. His resurrection proves his justice because it shows that the payment was accepted, that God's wrath was satisfied. Romans tells us, that Christ was delivered up for our offenses and raised for our justification. When he rose from the dead, the Father was saying the whole thing is paid. It's satisfied. All the sins are gone. And so the fact of Christ's resurrection brings us this wonderful fact, that we have fellowship with God now and forever through faith in him. There's one more fact, too, shown to us in this text. And, and it's not as important as the other ones, but it's also wonderful and seemingly unbelievable. And that is that we are new people. And we can do good works. In, in the first verse of chapter 2 in our text, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, John is clearly not telling us that we're going to be able to be perfect in this life. What he is doing is guarding us against two dangerous false ideas. The first is that we can be perfect. And he shows, I mean, right after he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, he says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And he just said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And what he's warning against here is this attitude of pride. To think, well, I've really made it now as a Christian. I've gotten good enough. I have achieved this level of perfection. I'm better than these other people. And if we think that way, well, then what use is Christ to us? His resurrection turns from fact to fiction. Because if we think that we're perfect, we're calling God a liar. And if God's a liar, then we have no basis for believing in the resurrection of Jesus. We have no basis for having fellowship with God, and we have no basis for eternal life. So it is imperative that we always recognize our great sinfulness, and God's Spirit alone causes us to do that. That's what, part of what faith is, confessing your sins and believing on Jesus. But the second thing that John is warning us about is an attitude that would say, well, I have fellowship with God because of Jesus. He's forgiven my sins. So it doesn't matter what I do. I'll just live however I want. That attitude, the attitude of our sinful flesh, is an extreme danger to faith because it's the opposite of faith. Faith alone is what saves us. And yet, as Martin Luther said, the faith that saves is never alone. A tree that is alive is going to bear fruit. As Jesus said to his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. John is encouraging us here 
that we can and must bear fruit, be new people, do good works. And this is a seemingly unbelievable fact because people aren't like this. You know, if you were to ask the Mythbusters to determine whether it was fact or fiction that people were basically selfish, if they were going to be honest, they would have to determine that people are selfish. Most people think of people as basically good, but they're not really looking at it closely enough. Most people are nice most of the time, but most of the time they're doing it for selfish reasons. So that somebody will be nice to me. There's a phrase I've heard, I've mentioned this before, but it's a good example. There's a phrase I heard somebody say once, uh, it's supposed to be advice for your marriage, it's bad advice, and the phrase is, happy wife, happy life. And the reason it's bad advice is because it gives the motivation to be kind to your wife as them being kind to you. That's not love. Love is being good and kind and loving to another person no matter how terrible they are to you and without any desire, any, any need for there to be anything coming back your way. That's love. And people do not have that by nature. We're selfish, we're loveless, we're evil, we're dark, we're sinful. People can't do what is good and right in God's eyes by nature. But Christ makes us into new people. His resurrection raises us to new life. Just as he said uh, through the Apostle Paul in Romans 6, he says, We are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And in Ephesians, he said, Once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. It is possible for us to do good works. And we do them as Christians every day. We bear these fruits. We also do evil works. For the Christian, to walk in the light means to confess our sins, to trust in Jesus for forgiveness, and to go on bearing fruit and keeping with repentance. All these seemingly unbelievable things are made facts through Christ's factual resurrection. It can't be studied, it can't be tested in a laboratory, but the apostles who were there, they studied it, they tested it, they saw it, they heard it, and they report it to us. They make us witnesses through faith. We are brought to have fellowship and eternal life with God through faith, and we too are brought to produce fruits in keeping with repentance. All of it because of Christ's resurrection. So truly, not only is Jesus not still in the grave, but his resurrection has meaning for us each day of our lives. And ultimately, the greatest meaning for us in eternal life in heaven. This is the fact that we have received from him. Let us believe it. For believing is seeing. Amen. Please arise. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. In me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Please be seated, and we'll sing him 208, verses 1 and 4 through 8. sons and daughters of the King, 
whom heavenly hosts in glory sing. Today the grave hath lost its sting. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. That night the apostles met in fear. Amidst them came their Lord most dear, and said, Peace be unto you here. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. When Thomas afterward had heard, he Jesus had fulfilled his word. He doubted if it were the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. Thomas, behold, my side, saith he, my hands, my feet, my body, see, and doubt not, but believe in me. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. No longer Thomas then denied. He saw the hand, the hands, the side. Thou art my Lord and God, he cried. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet whose faith hath constant been. In life eternal they shall reign. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Please arise, and we'll join in the responsive prayer printed in your bulletin. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, as you gather us together on this first day of the week, that your risen Son may come among us with his gifts of forgiveness and peace, grant us faith to receive him in joy, that having fellowship with him we might share in his eternal fellowship with you. Lord, in your mercy... Lord God, as your Son breathed out the Holy Spirit on his disciples, that they might bestow or withhold your forgiveness, let your Spirit rest also upon the pastors that he sends to serve us, that they may faithfully exercise their office in accord with his word. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, as you have given us all things in your Son, make us of one heart and one soul, that we may not hold on to the things of this world as though they were our own, but freely share what you have given us. Lord, in your mercy. 
Lord God, as your son in mercy invited Thomas to touch his wounds that he might not disbelieve, but believe, have mercy on all those who struggle with similar doubts and overcome them with your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, as you sent your son to save what was lost, forsake not those who have forsaken you. According to your mercy, work through us to seek out those who have wandered from your fellowship that they might walk once more in your light. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, as you have established worldly authorities to uphold the rule of law and maintain the public good, grant wisdom to all our leaders, remembering especially this day our local governments, that our communities may be ordered in peace and flourish in wholesome industry. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, as you have brought us into fellowship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ, sustain all those who suffer in body or mind with the truth of your presence with them, especially Pastor Jim Sandine and Hope Dexter. Hear their cries for help and heal them in accord with your good purposes. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, as your Son brought his resurrection peace to his disciples, grant comfort to all who know the sorrow of departed loved ones. We pray especially for the family of Don Ullman, who passed away recently. Let them not be overcome by their grief, but sustain them in the hope of the eternal life that you have manifested to us in your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. In your name we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated, and we'll conclude with hymn 732. Uh, you'll note that we won't sing the last note as long as it's written there. If for some reason, it's written for a really long time, and we'll sing what we're more familiar with.
through your triumph, grant grace sufficient for life's day, hey, that by our lives we truly say, Christ has triumphed, he is living, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Adoring praises now we bring, and with the heavenly blessed sing, Christ has triumphed, alleluia. Be to the Father and our Lord, to Spirit blessed, most holy God, all the glory never ending. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen. Good morning. Few announcements in the bulletin. We do have a voters meeting coming up April 26th, and this is likely going to be a very important voters meeting. We've um, submitted to the CLC boards, as, as we've been reporting for a couple of weeks, a proposal for buying land, building a church, and uh, we should get that back, I would assume, by the voters meeting. And so we'll be taking that up at the voters meeting, whether to go ahead with that or not, or, or I think we will. Anyway, that's the plan. Um, and also some constitutional matters, some constitutional amendments that need to be made. We do have Sunday school and Bible class after the service today. Well, I guess we don't have Sunday school. I don't think we have any Sunday school kids, right? So Bible class after, after the service today, 15 minutes afterwards. Council meeting this week. Um, any other announcements? I don't think so. All right. Well, may the...